Good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of 2022 of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. First agenda item is to agree whether to take item three in private, which is consideration of today's evidence. Are we all agreed? Okay, I see everyone nodding. That is agreed. The next um, agenda item, therefore, is to continue taking evidence on women's unfair responsibility for unpaid care and domestic work. This virtual roundtable session will have an intersectional focus on race, and I welcome to the meeting Farah Farzana, Race Equality Mainstreaming Officer at Simbo, Scotland, Mariam Ahmed, Chief Executive Officer Amina, the Muslim Women's Resource Centre, Trishna Singh, OBE, Director of Sikh Sanjong, Jog, sorry, uh, Joy Lewis, Chief Executive Officer, AAI Employability, and Sarah Mendel Jimenez, a member of NES UWT Equality Advisory Group. I refer our members to papers one and two. As we have a, a number of witnesses today, can I please ask members to indicate which witness they are initially directing your question to, and then open the floor to other witnesses for comments. Keen for the session to be as free-flowing as possible in this virtual format, so if other witnesses wish to respond to a question or to follow up on a point made by another witness, please can I ask them to indicate that by typing R in the chat function on BlueJeans, and I will bring you in if time permits. If you're merely agreeing with what other members are saying, there's no need to intervene to say so. Members can also use the chat function on BlueJeans if they wish to intervene. At the end of the session, if any of the witnesses feel that there are outstanding points they wish to address, please follow this up in writing, and the committee will take that evidence into account too. So I now invite each of our witnesses to make a short opening statement, starting with Farah Farzana, please. Good morning, and thank you very much for this opportunity to, to provide evidence on women's unfair responsibility for unpaid care and domestic work. So I'm here on behalf of Symbol Scotland, which is a national intermediary organisation and also a strategic partner of the Scottish Government Equality Unit. The aim of Symbol Scotland is to build the capacity of ethnic minority voluntary sector and its communities. We have a network of over 600 ethnic minority organisations throughout Scotland, to which we deliver a wide range of capacity building support programmes. Our current programmes include providing social enterprise development support to ethnic minority groups and social entrepreneurs, providing race equality and human rights mainstreaming support to public, statutory and third sector organisations, increasing ethnic minority representation on public boards, developing and supporting a Scottish national ethnic minority women's network for peer support and influencing social policy, developing and supporting an ethnic minority environmental network to engage in climate change policy, providing employability support to ethnic minority young people, and building organisational capacity to ethnic minority groups in and around the Glasgow region. Through all of our areas of work, this gives us an ample opportunity to continuously engage extensively with the ethnic minority sector and gather information on the needs and concerns affecting ethnic minority communities. And this, in turn, helps to inform our response to the development of national and local policies and to public consultations, such as uh, my presence here today. I also am a member of a. Uh, um, organisational charity, which I co-founded with my uh, sister back in 2014, called Al Masar, um, where we started because of a need of support to ethnic minority families within the Forth Valley area. Over the, the period of lockdown, so this was prior to me beginning with the symbol, um, prior to lockdown, I was heavily involved with supporting ethnic minority families, particularly mothers, um, during various responsibilities that they had to undertake, and that included emotional support, um, physical support, and um, obviously peer-to-peer, -peer and making sure that they were they, they felt that they were comfortable and safe, especially with um, declining mental health. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Farah. Um, if can I go to Mariam Ahmed, please? 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to this committee. Um, um, so my name is Miriam, and I am the Chief Executive of AMINA, um, which is a Muslim and BME women's rights organisation. And we're a leading grassroots organisation, um, and our special services aim to fill a gap in Scotland so women can participate fully in society without fear of discrimination. Um, we offer a range of services from our national helpline for women in crisis, our befriending service, employability guidance, financial inclusion, violence against women campaigning, creative arts, as well as financial inclusion casework and women's rights casework. With that being said, BME women still remain the most vulnerable in our society, experiencing multiple levels of discrimination. Um, where what we find is racial inequality intersects with gender inequality. BME women are still facing additional barriers to support of services um, and accessing economic resources. Um, so, actually, being in this committee, what I would say is, is that the work that women have been doing still remains to be undervalued. Um, you know, a lot of BME women we found that we were supporting were already doing what we would call the lion's share of domestic chores, looking after the children, being unpaid carers. But with with the pandemic, with the restrictions, we found that existing inequalities had deepened, um, and there were certain factors towards that: women facing more poverty, financial hardship, um, their leisure, leisure time, struggling to cope, not having Wi-Fi. So there was a range of things that happened within AMNA that we supported. So I'm looking forward to within today's committee hearing providing a bit more evidence on this. Thank you, Mariam. And if now we can hear from uh, Trishna Singh, please. Thank you very much for inviting us to speak at this um, committee. Um, Sex and, jo Sex and Jog has been running for 35 years, and we are the only Sikh family support charity in Scotland. Um, and our focus has always been is linking women, Sikh women and other ethnic minorities to every, all their social, educational and employment opportunities. So we have been bridging that gap for 35 years, and we know from our experience that there are so many women from the Sikh community and from other communities who are still just sitting on the fringes waiting for them to be able to access mainstream support, whether that be in employment or looking at caring services. Um, there are not many of them that access any of the carers support groups that are out there. And so we find that we are bridging that gap, working with these women. Um, over the years, we have developed into an organisation that has been providing holistic and intersectional services, and we are that gap between mainstream services um, and even policymakers. But we know from a very young age, when we are speaking about the Sikh community, it is not visible in any of the larger research projects that have been done on consultations. And we have found that over the past 10 years or so, it has been the role of Sikhs and Job to make sure that those voices are heard. And we know that from a many, very young age, Sikh women have had a completely different upbringing compared to their white Scottish peers. So, you know, women are left to juggle both the domestic life work and the commitments of looking after or caring for people at home, whether it be children with disabilities or elderly, fam elderly family members. And that is something that, although it is being raised now, um, we know that women have been living with those kind of issues for well over 30, 40 years. So I'm looking forward to um, answering any questions that come up. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Trishna. And uh, we can now hear from uh, Joy Lewis, please. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for inviting me here today. I am pleased to be able to give evidence on behalf of Adopt an Intern, now trading as AAI Employability. We started 12 years ago promoting and facilitating paid internships. We now include a variety of inclusive recruitment services. And as a social enterprise, we attract a large following of women returners and diversity in all its forms. We also work with government through grants to support minority ethnic women into work. Our access to employers is key to the success of our programmes as it ensures networking and the breaking down of perceived barriers on both sides. Since COVID, we have delivered three such programmes 
adapting them for our changed world. It is known that unfair domestic and caring responsibilities are a result of societal norms, but a study by the Fawcett Society confirmed that around three quarters of minority ethnic women reported doing the majority of the housework or childcare during lockdown. Our own minority ethnic audience tend to be highly qualified women who, through no fault of their own, feel undervalued and lack confidence. The pandemic hits and they find themselves in a new country with imperfect English, no support system, children to be homeschooled in a foreign language, and going out shopping holds its own fears with minority ethnic people more susceptible to COVID. Issues with digital access and no recourse to public funds all added to the nightmare for these women. Community support wasn't ready, and when the third sector did manage to reach out, there was no centralised channel, which was often their place of face, which was closed. We are not a research or umbrella organisation. The evidence I present today is based on our experience of working closely with minority ethnic women on their employment journey. Right now, we are working with 60 on the latest Women Returners project funded by government, and the majority have an honours or do doctoral degree. Minority ethnic women in work were more likely to be furloughed and more likely to lose their jobs than white women. The loss of financial security and the feeling of being undervalued at both work and home was exacerbated by having nowhere to go for support and guidance. The extreme loss of confidence and self-belief that followed left them open to mental health issues. Downward spiral was created, which now must be reversed, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because fundamentally, Scotland needs this incredible talent. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. And if we now go to Sarah Mendel Jimenez. Oh, no, stop. Don't move. Hi there. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a teacher, <laughs> and you can you will probably hear my class leaving very quietly. <laughs> so, um, so yes, I'm a member of the NSAUT. You can leave very quietly, class. Thank you. I'm a member of the NSAUT and also a Black Members uh, Committee um, worker. Thank you, class. Sorry. This is what women have to do. This is a perfect example of what women have to do. We have to juggle everything. Children, other people's children. Au revoir. <laughs> bye bye, class. I'll start as they leave. I don't want to make them late for their next class. Bye bye, class. Well, that's okay. Just take just take some time. It's fine. This is a good good example. Sorry. Props are always allowed. So this is an excellent example, and I think if I if I look at my life in lockdown, this is was also an excellent example. Uh, you know, my husband and I uh, we had a young child during lockdown, before lockdown I actually started, and my maternity leave that I had saved for so long for, to just have that time with my baby was totally scrapped uh, by lockdown. You know, many of us teachers we were forced to come back to work earlier than we wanted to. Uh, I have some statistics here from uh, the big survey question. This is a survey that the NSAWT uh, does. Women were far more likely to be doing at least more on-site teaching during lockdowns, 60% versus 50%. Women are more likely to have received criticism from parents, 30% versus their 26 counterparts. We are seen as a soft target sometimes. 20% uh, we 20 of women over 15% of men received verbal abuse from parents. Women were also more likely to say that their workload had increased, 60% over 51. I think overall as women, we were, were seen as, as beings that can just take it all. And it's just, and we can't because um, 88% versus 76% of, um, of teachers, we, female teachers, felt that anxiety. 59% said that flexible working hours were impossible. My employer today was very happy to give me time, but of course other female colleagues were actually ill with COVID. There was nowhere to put these children, unfortunately. Um, half 
almost half, 49%, said they were not aware of any policies or processes at their workplace that would actually um, help them deal with the problem of increasing sexual harassment, both from staff and pupils. And through my work of the, um, at the Scottish Trade Union Congress, the Black Members Committee, um, I've, I've also become more aware of the intersectionality. And, and it's just heartbreaking to see, you know, Muslim colleagues that are really trying to, to climb this corporate ladder. And, and they can't because they feel that the, the environments we have, they're so male dominated that they just can't um, go to the pub on a Friday afternoon and build those relationships. I myself with a small child um, and with zero interest in football, I feel like I can't have a, a conversation with senior management sometimes because it is male dominated again. Um, and there's just so much to do, so much to do. And I keep the faith, I really do. But sometimes when you look at the evidence, you just, you just don't know where to start. And that's all I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the, 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 the boys club is something we all need to be very alert to um, in, in just in daily life, because sometimes it's not, not a deliberate thing. But um, yeah, I think you make a good point there. there. So th thanks, thanks everyone for, for your comments. We're now going to move on to um, questions um, from the um, committee members and a bit of a discussion. And as I said earlier, if the members will will suggest who they think they want to hear from first, but if, if you want to respond to a particular question as well, do you who are in the chat? So moving to Maggie Chapman first, please. Thank you very much, Joe. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to the panel uh, members for being with us this morning. I appreciate that juggling, um, juggling various things is, is not... I appreciate the time that, that you've taken to, to give us evidence uh, this morning, I've, I've got a couple of questions, if, if I may. Um, we, we've heard it, the media has reported, and indeed uh, many of you have mentioned this morning, of the disproportionate impacts of COVID on women, on BAME women particularly. And I suppose there, there's that, that there's the complexities that, that I'm, I'm trying to uh, I'm interested in, in trying to understand how how BAME, BAME women experienced those uh, disproportional susceptibilities to COVID, disproportional financial burdens. Um, I, I think it was Marion who talked about digital poverty and the lack of digital connectivity and therefore the knock-on consequences for that. So, so if, I can, if I can come to you, Marion, first, um, could, could you say a little bit more about the, the personal experiences of some of the women that, that you support and that you and Amina have worked with? How, how did the lockdown, the, 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 the restrictions placed on, on society as a whole, how, what were the, the women's experiences in terms of their, their ability to maintain any kind of work-life balance, um, and importantly, on, on their mental health? And I'll, I'll, I've got another question after that, but I'll come to Marion first. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie, for your question. Um, okay, so I think if we kind of go pre-lockdown, before lockdown and everything started, we were already kind of on an unequal footing. So I would say that BME women, we would already said, were already unequal within society. But really, what does that look like once the pandemic had started? Um, I would always say that BME women and the women that we've supported have already always done the lion's share of work when it comes to household chores. And I think that's been those kind of real traditional gender roles have always been there, you know, where maybe if she is, if the woman is going out to work, she's still expected to kind of come home and do all the housework, but adding on to homeschooling. Um, but a lot of women, I think it was almost like kids going to school was their chance to have a bit more of maybe leisure time or ESOL classes or just trying to upskill themselves. But with homeschooling, how can you upskill your skill self and do homeschooling? But also, I think what's been really underestimated during the pandemic is a lot of women that we supported stayed within extended family households. So now what you've got is your husband's working from home, your brother-in-law, your mother-in-law working from home, everyone's working from home, you're running the household, the cooking, the cleaning, the homeschooling, there's just no time for yourself. 
Um, so uh, what we found was that women were really isolated, and um, them having that kind of escapism or just upskilling themselves, that kind of out or that outlet just was not there. For women to say, okay, I'm going to go into my class right now online, and um, it wasn't there. Also, what we found was that women were expected to work, but the digital inclusion part, I think, for me, was really quite overwhelming. Overnight, you know, everything was digital. We weren't allowed to come visit women or show them how to log on or even just apply for universal credit. Um, so we were kind of having to do that, or they didn't have any Wi-Fi. Universal credit systems were saying, well, you know, you can just apply online; it's quicker. They'd made it calling Universal Credit or just Benefits Helpline just so inaccessible that everything was online. And if you didn't have Wi-Fi, that was an issue. It was great, you know, we offered women thirty tablets and etc. But then there was nobody to actually show them how to set them up. You know, etc. So that we were always facing those challenges. We did find that a lot of women were experiencing a lot of financial difficulty. We had about three hundred and twenty-one calls all during the pandemic up until December, just of women experiencing financial difficulty. But also, what we found was that women in crisis, although we're always dealing with women in crisis. A lot of the cases were a lot more complex than what they were before. So you had women staying with the perpetrator, you know, if he was an abusive husband, extended family, but the kids are homeschooling. There was just no out. There was no out for women to actually phone Amina um, to come to classes, but to also figure out during lockdown how do I escape an abusive relationship. So there was a lot of that kind of going on. But then also you've still got the Department of Working Pensions or Universal Credit saying you need to look for a job. You know, um, and then the job that you're looking for is part time. Um, so the poverty increases. Um, we also supported a lot of women whose husbands um, were maybe undocumented and not declaring their work as proper, were being unpaid low or lower paid, but then their employers were not claiming furlough. So suddenly the women who had a bit of income coming in, that had stopped also. But when they were going to universal credit um, or just to apply for universal credit, they just don't have those skills there that are needed for jobs. So those, those are the kind of issues that we, kind of we came across. We did actually um, have a hardship fund as well. Um, we set up a hardship fund, and during the pandemic, we paid out about twenty thousand pound, over twenty thousand pound of women in crisis and in poverty. Um, so that just kind of gives you a bit of a picture of what we were kind of dealing with: just severe poverty, access to Wi-Fi, digital, you know iPads, tablets, it, it was very difficult and it was challenging on services like ourselves because I think almost like we end up doing a lot of unpaid work, I would say as well, our staff. So we were kind of going out our way and doing things that were I would say above and beyond, but it's things that we had to do in order to get women a bit of an equal footing. That, thanks very much, Mariam. That that's that's really helpful and, and interesting. And um, I'm especially struck by that the point you made around undocumented workers as well and, and obviously all of the all of the added complexities or, or, or the, the, the 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 cracks that that they they fall through anyway and then you add the pandemic on top of it and it's and it's magnified and, and exacerbated um Sarah you talked you saw you talked about women as being seen as a soft as a soft touch and I'm wondering how much of how, how, how much of that was was um Sort of magnified, I suppose, during during the pan, during the pandemic. I, I know I, I see in the chat uh, there are a couple of other uh, people who want to come in, but Sarah, do you want to say just a little bit more about you know, it, part in answer to to my original question as well, but but also that that soft touch element that you spoke about in your in your opening comments? Yeah, I think I, I think we're both seen as a soft touch and a soft target. As in, you know, I, I've noticed that. Uh, for, again, from anecdotal evidence from my colleagues, um, you know, other teachers of color, that often, you know, we are seen as the people that can take extra work. So, you know, something that we call the black tax, that some colleagues uh, that are white may be expected to do less and do things that are more in line with our job descriptions. And and then, you know, teachers of colors are seen as, as you know, they are given extra work and women even more. Um, so that that's one thing. So um, the other thing is, I think there's this this cultural, you know, it's still this this imbalance, this power structure between men and women, and and men and especially men in a position of power, they still expect women to take on more. And women sometimes are are actually the ones that perpetuate this myth of like I had it hard, but you think you have it hard. I've had it way harder. You know, an example of this was in a boys' school I used to work at. 
and you know my colleagues have been there 20 years and they they were treated terribly by their male counterparts you know 30 years ago or whatever and you know they made a point of making your life hard to see if you were made of the right stuff um in addition to that so yes yeah, so it's easier to tell a female teacher off than than, than a male teacher um i think because male teachers will just say no I disagree. Whereas women teach, I, I don't know if it's something the way we are because you know uh, we are genetically made to to consider others, and we we immediately take blame on ourselves. Oh, maybe it's the way I'm doing things, and then you realize no, this is not the way. I, you know, there's no this. And as you get older, you become more confident. Um, and I think going back to your initial question, I think you, you know a lot of it was space poverty, especially if you were living in cities. Uh, there was no the sofa and my other half was working on the kitchen table because our son was napping because our son was napping and neither of us could work from the other room um also wi-fi difficulties of course um again if you had a, a big family and suddenly you had to work what go from two devices to five how on earth do you do that and you know Often I see, you know, even at home, even though my other half is very happy to cook and clean and everything else, when it comes to devices, you know, I have to share my device with my son. You know, um, you know, my, my my other half is a bit too worried that something might happen to his device. You know, if if my son plays with it. Um, so you know, little things like like that, and of course, you know, bigger things like uh, what the other uh, ladies have said. Um, that yeah, the lion share, of course cooking, cleaning, all of that predominantly falls on women still. Um, so yeah, so I think we are seen as a, as a soft target, as, as an easy target, uh, both for giving extra work, uh, for any kind of uh, reprimand, um, and like I said, anecdotally from other female teachers, they just are seen to, to be doing a lot more, taking more on. When we shouldn't, we are a unionized profession, and we should say that is not part of my job description. And if you want me to do this as part of, you know, personal development, then this should be a target rather than just saying yes in the hope to then climb the corporate ladder. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, Joe, that's me, but I, I know that Farah, Trishna, and Joy want to come in. Uh, okay, if, if if Farah comes in. Yeah. Have you? Have you? You'd, yeah. You bring them, them in. Farah, did you want to, to say something about this? Yes, um, uh, thank you very much. Um, basically, going uh, following on from what uh, my colleagues uh, have been saying about this is a question that I have been like nitpicking at, like getting right to the root of of understanding. Um, I mean, we talk about gender roles within ethnic minority families, and one thing was in, in preparation of coming to today's committee, one thing that I, I was asking um, colleagues and friends, etc., was when we're trying to explain what cultural barriers ethnic minority women face that are different from um, non ethnic minority women, um, how, how would you describe that? And I think that's something that should be taken into consideration is, you know, where are we coming from? Um, and why are why is as as um, Manira was saying um, why 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 do I think minority women take on the lion's share of the work and it is pretty much the way that we have been brought up generationally it is our culture uh, we we have a, a we have ingrained within us the, the fire the family hierarchy in that. We are brought up to serve, to serve our elders, to give respect, etiquette. As women, um, we have traditionally been trained to serve others and to do the domestic work. Um, and at any point, if we do not fulfil those expectations, there is an emotional backlash, in in the sense that you are being made to feel that you are not good enough. Um, or perhaps you know you're ungrateful for things that you have been given. Um, I know that sounds like really horrible in, in in a sense, but on on the flip side of that is because you know we make that effort to have these close family relations. It also means that we do tend to be emotionally and physically reliant on each other, especially you know when we think about a parent and child relationship. So there is that. Um, 
that need to depend on either grandparents or aunts and uncles, you know, have that family support system. And, and again, this is just in a typical traditional kind of format. So obviously, if you're coming here into into Scotland um, and you don't have that family support system, that impacts you in various ways, and obviously that includes being an unpaid carer. And this whole notion of being an unpaid carer is actually still quite new, and it's still something that seems very alien, um, because we're told that taking care of our families and of our children, it's an obligation, it's not an option. So this is something that we have to do. We just have to get on with it. And but if we ever seek outside help, and that that's seen as a form of weakness. So we have we, these are the kind of pressures that we talk about um, within a family structure and within a household structure. Um, and imagine then, obviously, if you're a single parent as well, you've still got all these expectations to be able to do absolutely everything, plus take on the role of a father. Um, or the other other spouse, on top of maintaining the this whole you know a uh, hierarchy, and that's only family. <laughs> I've not even like touched by the, the the impact of community and society because of these unrealistic expectations that we have of perfection. And again, these are ingrained within ethnic minority girls at such a young age, and that impacts on self confidence. It impacts on our mental health. It impacts on, you know, our ability and how we see ourselves as well. So this is the very, very root, the very, very foundation of what the cultural barriers are that we are working so hard to overcome. I think that point, the points that I'm making, is quite important to help understand what the barriers actually are. So you know, put yourself in our shoes, basically, to see to to understand better. Obviously, as um, you know, we're at the committee today. We're sitting here with you know um, policymakers. Um, you know, there's nothing about us without us, sort of thing. So I, I just want to uh, take an opportunity and thank and, and be grateful for being here and being able to provide that insight. Thank, thanks very much for, for that, Farah. Uh, Krishna, you wanted to come in on this. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm kind of completely agree with. It. The, what both speakers have already said, um, so there's, I don't want to go over that, but I think one of the main things for me is for people to understand that people like Farah and um, Amina, we're also talking about women who are second, third, fourth, even fifth generation born and brought up in Scotland, and they are still juggling, and people are mentally, women are mentally juggling two cultures, and that has a huge impact on your mental health. Especially when you know that you've been, you know, you are part of the Scottish community. We are citizens of Scotland, and yet all of these things are still going on underneath this layer. And the the main thing for me is that was in our organisation. Normally, on a weekly basis, we would maybe have had 25, 30 women dropping in by. But once the pandemic hit, we were contacted by over a hundred women every week. But a whole range of issues that came out from actually having an autistic child at home, and before that child was able to go to some play group or whatever, and that gave them a wee bit of space. But to be at home and not have any access to anybody, and again, as um, Farah just said before me, that the the fact of having all pe everybody at home, and some of these people were the perpetrators of domestic violence. So you're actually living where you have no space to go out, and what the pandemic has done is actually it's actually brought everything out into the open. A lot of these things were happening, and people were seeing them, and they were in people were talking about them, but nothing was actually being done. And what for me the biggest, most significant thing has been the fact that the mainstream services are there for people from the white Scottish community, and then you have a layer of the third sector services for the white Scottish community. If you look at the ethnic communities, every service that is there to bridge that gap is voluntary sector, is third sector, and, and th this, this needs to be addressed because when it comes to employment and mental health issues, and also somebody said earlier about helping people to you know fill in forms for universal credit, a lot of these women, even although English is their first language, but they've never been online. 
so they couldn't. We had our, our outreach staff were on the phone for three hours at a time, helping somebody to fill in a universal credit form. And the and COVID has also raised many many issues for education at school for children at home. Everybody was doing homeschooling, but for a lot of the women from our communities who had left school when they were really young, homework was a completely different level. And you know, and in some ways, Joy I think highlighted the other side of the scale of women who are highly educated and are struggling for work. Now we we work with a whole mix of women, and we are at the other end where women had just started getting their freedoms, started getting money and, and that was theirs that they could spend when they wanted, and what they and all of that's gone because a lot of them worked in the low paid sector, which was home care, um, working in shops and with zero contract hours. And so you can just imagine if that little bit of freedom that they had was completely taken away by COVID. And we don't know how that's going to look now. We have just produced the very first ever research for Sikh women in Scotland. We launched it in December at the Parliament. And I'll just put it in the chat. And you'll see if you can get it on our uh, website. But I just feel that uh, there's many issues that you know cut across all BME communities. But there are some areas where people are just not visible. Yeah. Thank you, Trishna, and, and thanks for that link. I, I, I know one of my colleagues will probably want to come in on that later. Uh, Joy, did you want to come in on this? Thank you. And, and very briefly, um, yes, I look forward to talking about the employment aspects of this later. Um, but um, I, I, it was wonderful to hear so many personal stories. Um, and uh, first-hand knowledge, and, and we saw this too um, during a, a project that we created from Government Wellbeing Fund. Um, <clears throat> we found cultural integration was nigh on impossible for those who were obviously new to the country. And um, uh, our most well-received advice for, for parents was literally how they could maintain discipline of their child, play with them, as well as teach them without outside influence of any kind. And the program that we developed focused on resilience and mindset, and we really couldn't talk about much else. We, we, we did go on to do finances and employability, but first of all, we needed to look at family life, on, on getting them stronger, putting back a bit of confidence before we could talk about employability, before we go on to sort their finances out. Um, so that resilience piece, with, with coaches who are trained in this was absolutely key at this stage. Um, so, so getting that resilience up uh, and, uh, enabled them to absorb further information. We also note that lack of confidence worsens when women can't meet others in their situation. Uh, and whether that was through lack of digital awareness or just not being able to go out and socialize, um, and we, we saw this um, uh, in, we have Facebook groups for our cohorts of minority ethnic women, and um, they cite discussions with women in the same boat as them as extraordinarily impactful and helpful. So trying to get them together was, was key for us so that they could hear they weren't the only ones in this unfortunate situation. And what we are left with now, though, is a lack of awareness of what the rules are going back after long lockdowns. And, and many minority ethnic women um, who are looking for work, which is commensurate to their skill set, um, now doubt whether they have the ability to get out there again. And that's another mindset and confidence issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that, Joy. I'll hand back to you, Joe, and, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. As I see Sarah was hoping to come back in. They'll, they'll, I mean, don't hesitate to try and make your point later um, if, I, if I haven't got time to bring you back in just now, which I, which I don't. I'm going to go now to Pam Duncan Glancy, please. Thank you, convener, and thank you very much to the panel this morning for, for your opening statements and also for the testimony that you've already given. Um, I've been I've been furiously trying to take uh, take notes um, as I've been listening. It's been really really helpful. I also want to say thank you for everything that you've done um, during the the past um, couple of years um, and beyond. Um, it has been a, a significantly di more difficult uh, two years for for the people you represent than, than many of us in Scotland. And I just want to say thank you for everything that you did for that. 
Um, I have a couple of areas of questions. My first question is about um, the financial security of the women that that um, you support, and of course that the risk that women's unfair responsibility for pay uh, for unpaid care and domestic work um, was, was could could get worse, and that was identified during um, during the budget process. Um, I wondered perhaps if um, Farah and possibly Joy um, and Miriam may may want to answer. Um, has it? Um, has the ability to find paid work and income um, been been seriously put at risk during the during the pandemic? You've already touched on some of this, but um, and what is the what is the current picture of the financial situation, the families that you you represent? Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Pam, um, for that. So, in in terms of uh, financial security. So if we're talking about women who have got children, for example, then that has pretty much been zero to none because it has revolved around childcare. So perhaps in the, again, it's a, you've got the the role of women and obviously in their gender role as being the primary caretaker, and obviously if you're relying on extended family or friends even. To look after children, or even child uh, after school care, etc. Because of you know lockdown, all that had been removed. You know there was restrictions going on, so it was really difficult for women to actually find paid work. Um, and especially one one of the things that I've heard um, it is literally because of there's no been especially if you think about families. Who have no recourse to public funds, so you know they they they've either you know been they, they don't have the uh, option of furlough. Um, so if you're thinking about as a, a woman who's at home with children, they've got no access to uh, to public funds. So therefore, you know, universal credit is just absolutely you know that that's yeah, not an option. Um, so how how are they actually going to you know provide and support for their families? And especially typically where you know if the male is the breadwinner of the family um, and they're having to either stop working or reduce working and they don't have the option of furlough um, or you know again racial discrimination in the workplace causes either people to leave their jobs or you know they get uh, forced to leave. Um, so it has been very difficult in in terms of that financial security. Um, we know of certain cases where we're trying to help some women maybe fill out the Scottish Welfare uh, Fund applications, and if not being that, you know, rallying around just within the community to be able to help and support. There was lots of funding. You know, there was. Ample opportunity, and so I'm saying this like from the, the grassroots perspective that the work that uh, I had done um, with our charity, and you know we did get funding for helping women, but again that's quite restrictive on what you can do with that. For example, even something simple as getting a maybe a wee gift card uh, from ASDA. That's something that we had uh, done in this last Omicron lockdown, and that that was very very well received. But in in terms of the ability to pay find paid work that is flexible. So not only do you have to juggle childcare, you have to juggle your own home life. You've got to juggle the language barriers. You've got to juggle the knowledge as well, the accessibility of information, um, and your competing attention or between children or between other family members, as well as caring responsibilities of other family members. So whether this be um, parents that live with you, or uh, children with additional support needs, it has definitely I can it has been very hard to find paid work, and especially if you're a woman and you're um, self-employed as well. Um, again, like say for example, beauticians, they they were one of the worst services to have been affected as well, like through lockdown because they had to come they cut down all their services. Um, so I'm just wondering if any of my other colleagues would like to come in on that. Uh, 
Um, are you? Oh, I see Trishna's wanting to come in. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, as I said, whatever, you know, everything that's already been said applies across, across the board to, you know, vast majority of ethnic minority women. And we know from our own experience, the, the biggest stigma that is still around, even although this pandemic has hit, and people are actually at the end of everything, at the end of their road mentally and physically with trying to keep things going. The stigma, that's the biggest thing that still stops women from coming forward. And that's something that needs to be acknowledged and recognised. And all of the, the evidence that we give is, uh, might sound, comes across as anecdotal, but somewhere along the line, this anecdotal thing needs to change. And we need to have some kind of way of creating, I mean, our research that we did, the Seek Women Speak report, it was because there was nothing about Sikh women at all in any manner or form in Scotland. So that's why, and this is a first step. But for me, going forward, there needs to be more in-depth research on these areas, and it should be across the board because not one size fits all. And some of the work that people like Farah have been doing through SEMVO, we might be doing that, but it'll be in a different way because the needs and the mental health of women from different communities is affected differently. Some women have been doing the same thing for so long, they have internalised it, and they think that's just normal. And then, on the other hand, when you're trying to explain to them that this is not normal, you need to have a life. You need to acknowledge that you are a human being as well. It's very, very difficult, and it's really difficult to explain that. And it's difficult to put it down on paper to make a report out of it, so that then you're saying that, yeah, this is what the statistics are, and this is what's happening out there. But we have women who are completely now traumatised by the fact that they've, the, the small job that they had, they can no longer access that. The, and like was said before, you know, where the man is the main breadwinner, and if he's unemployed and at home, that's making it doubly worse for them. So even if they were able to go out and get a job, the stigma of the woman working and the man not is, is still very, very rife in the communities. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I think. Um... Joy, Mariam, and Sarah want to come in if that's okay. I'll, I'll go to Joy. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to quote the the Fawcett Society again, but over a fifth of BME women, um, in a study they did, 21% felt that they were unfairly selected for furlough because of their race, sex, age, disability, or health condition, compared to just one percent of white women. So, money has um, was often an issue within with when a minority ethnic woman was put on furlough, clearly. And their contribution to the household became less important and her value came under scrutiny. There's definitely a gender imbalance in the perception of the value of work. But loss of employment opportunities led to the loss of financial security and an increase in low value work, so zero contract, zero hours contracts, for example, reinforced the decreased self-belief and confidence. So we heard a lot, it's all I am worthy of, no one else wants me. And that's horrible to hear. But lower value jobs lead to decreased confidence and it's a downward spiral. Many of our cohort of women um, had taken low skilled jobs just to get some money in. And we know they could do more than that. And the pandemic has uh, affected their decision capabilities and it's not their confidence, as I keep saying. Um, but fear of going for a job, concern that it will affect much needed benefits. There's also a fear of taking something else on and not being able to cope with it. Um, so um, I do have um, uh, uh, some thoughts on uh, uh, on this, um, um, but I'm going to keep them for when we talk more about employment. Um, so thank you. I'll let others speak. I think we're wanting to go to Mariam. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, it, it just, I, do, I don't want to kind of reiterate the points that are already being made. Um, one thing that I would say is, is that really no recourse to public funds, I think, has been quite a big impact on women. Um, 
One thing that I am now, my background is actually in violence against women, so that's the kind of specialism that I had. So even while I was the chief executive, and I'm still in AM, and I'm still doing um, domestic abuse casework, one thing that I did find was um, services actually did improve for a lot of BME women with no recourse to public funds, in the sense that um, a lot of local authorities automatically gave women hotels to stay in, rather than questioning and making them destitute. However, what we did find was that women were just given those hotels in like a basic food package. There was really nothing else with that. And so that was quite difficult. And I think when it comes to looking at employability and employability options, there's really two groups of women. Um, you've got the one kind of group of women that are British born, kind of understand the system. They know how to apply for jobs. But again, there is a lot of, I would say, racial inequality. You kind of feel like, am I getting passed up? about these jobs because of my name or whatever. And that kind of systemic racism is always quite difficult to prove. But we've also got and we supported a lot of women that were maybe going for what we would call a lot of the low paid jobs. But again, digital inclusion was a big issue. And even for warehouse jobs, it was upload your CV online and send that to us and apply for the job online. Everything, including pay slips, were online. So we had women that were managing to maybe get a few of these low paid employments, but they were finding them difficult to maintain. They didn't know how to access their pay slips, again, how to access any of those systems. So again, there was really nobody with that isolation and also the fact that you needed part time work. Um, so kind of having universal credit, putting that kind of pressure on you to say that, look, you need to get a job. Um, you need to get one ASAP or else there might be sanctions. But at the same time, when you're looking for employment, you're looking for part time. I, I still think that the benefit system does not take into question that kind of pressure that women have for childcare. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Jo. That was what I wanted to say about that. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to, um, yeah, once again, reiterate everything Mariam and Farah and Joy, Trishna. Um, I wanted to just add two things on to um, employment, something that has come ac across a lot. There was a story called Closing the Gap, still not visible, and it was talking about how, again, with, you know, the, the cultures that we come from, we, we, we put service and family above most things. And, and that, unfortunately, that doesn't work to our favour when we come to interviews. The star approach um, interviews that are, you know, customary in Scotland and the UK that benefit those that have grown up here, those that actually went to nursery and started from a very young age to actually present and talk and boast about their achievements. You know, we are not educated that way, and unfortunately, that's why we miss out. Uh, so in this study, it was really interesting, interesting to see that feedback. Whenever we get feedback, especially as women, we get told that we're not quite the right personality, even though we might have the same skill set and a similar experience that a white counterpart, we just don't seem to sell ourselves as much. And of course, it is a vicious circle. You know, the more, the longer you stay out of employment, the longer it is to get back. Um, and another really important thing that seems to be coming across through Stock and the Black Workers Committee is the the Qualities Act and how, in principle, like most things, like colour blindness um, has been, you know, in principle sounds like a good, like a good thing. You know, we are all equal, but the problem is that doesn't seem, and it's, you know, it's going back to what everybody else has said, it, it, that doesn't, you know, take the nuances and doesn't, you know, treat everybody like they need to be treated. Another big thing about the, these protected characteristics, and if you ever feel that you are the victim of injustice at work, you then have to, if you don't have a union, then it's really hard to navigate how on earth, the first thing you go to Google, it talks about, uh, you know, an employment tribunal. How on earth do you do that? without actually facing being fired and you know and actually not having that income that you 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 need um in addition to that and this is why i think would be a great thing for I, I i i my knowledge of laws and parliament is not good enough unfortunately but at the moment the you know the burden of proof lays on the victim so we all we have to be the ones that despite not having a job despite not having the right conditions despite having all these things to do at home, it still comes to us to actually fix the problem and provide evidence. And a lot of it is verbal evidence. And, you know, 
how do you prove that? How do we prove that, you know, somebody, you know, gave us some nasty comments or unfair comments in a feedback? How do we how do we prove that we didn't get the job because, you know, people think we might have another kid very soon, you know, because, you know, we're in that age and, you know, I'm likely to have another kid soon. And actually, no, we don't want to give Sarah that much responsibility because then we have to get a maternity leave cover. You know, how do we prove these things? Um, and I think that's, you know, the law needs to change. It needs to make it easier. Just just how the law for, you know, for rape is changing, you know, just like that. It just needs to change. Um, another thing that Police Scotland, as part of my job, I work with Police Scotland, they talk about um, employment. For the very first time ever, 11 of their BME applicants, officers passed the assessment centre and they passed it because Police Scotland said, we're doing it wrong. We need to do it right. And now what they do, they got rid of this colorblind list, they have a positive action team, they call any applicant from a BME or a protected characteristic, um, and they call them and they ask them about their life, what are you doing, why, why are you applying? And you know, sometimes they have to postpone applications, but for the first time, 11 out of 11 have come through. And you know, I am hopeful things can change. And I, I love the fact that we're invited here to, to give testimony of of what we have, but of course, you know, anecdotal evidence, just like Trishna said, needs to come into something solid soon, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're, I'm not hearing Pam, so I'm going to now move on to Pam. Convener. Oh, sorry, convener. Would it be possible? Um, do I have time to ask another question, or do you want to come back to me at the end? Can I come back to you? Because I think we're, 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 I will come back to you, but just let's let's okay. just take it slightly longer, maybe. Um, Pam Pam Gossel. Thank you, convener, and uh, thank you to the panel for their opening statements and also sharing their personal experience and the work they've done. And I would also personally, just like my colleague Pam said, like to thank all the work you've done for the BAME community and women throughout the you know COVID and um, before that. My question is around that we heard in our last calls of evidence, and today we've heard this as well, the restrictions of the pandemic put many women in a vulnerable position in terms of relying on the partner's income and further interacting with support services, which we've heard today. A Sikh Women's Aid report drew attention to specific characteristics on domestic violence in the BEAM community. The Ethnic Minority Resilience Network made recommendations that there should be investment in bespoke, multilingual and multicultural mental health services, which we heard today from Trishna when she spoke about not one size fits all. And so do you think, in light of these findings, that there should be more investment uh, to provide uh, bespoke services in the third sector organisations with specific to capacity to reach out to BAME women subject to domestic violence. And my question goes out to first, if Farah can come on, and then if it's okay, Trishna, and if there's anybody else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pam, for that question. And um, my background uh, is about supporting women as well, who um, through lived experience, sorry, through, uh, who have survived and have supported uh, women of domestic violence as well during the pandemic. Um, I believe, uh, not me, sorry, um, but there is a general, long, I'm, I'm trying to find the right way to articulate this. Money doesn't need to go into third sector organisations for these bespoke services. Money needs to actually get put into the public services to be able to provide the basic human rights of any women going through domestic violence. For example, um, women that we have supported through domestic violence during lockdown, we had the, there needs to be more cultural awareness within frontline police officers, for example, because at the end of the day, when, when we were in lockdown, police were the first point of contact in any of these kind of situations and the fact that they're not aware of the cultural difficulties that speaks volumes in itself so it's not just about third sector it's our public services 
And when we talk about the mental health as well, it has to be coming from public services. Why should it be down to voluntary and third sector organisations to fill the gaps in when the data, when the evidence, when everything is there to say that this is a real problem? There is the potential, the, the fix is there. It's not going to be the perfect fix, but it is a beginning and it should not be on the likes of um, myself, for example, who also suffers from mental health issues, but uh, to support other women who, ha who are going through the same issue. Um, so, in, in short, um, not to third sector organisations solely, but public services desperately need that, um, desperately need that uh, training. And that is a lot of the work that, again, we are doing through Simple Scotland from the Race Equality Mainstreaming Programme. It is to instil that cultural awareness to those services from a leadership perspective. And I think it does come back down to when we look at public sector leaders, what diversity do we see there? Because if we do not see that diversity, that empathy, that sympathy is not there. So, therefore, equalities, especially you know, looking at women in domestic violence situations, that is always going to be something that is going to be an arm's length um, issue. It is not going to be something that hits home. So that would be my um, request to the committee today to certainly look at what and how effective is the implementation of race equality in frontline services, and how would that be measured? Thank you, Farah. I think we have Ms. Trishna there. Hi, yes, thanks, Pam. Um, again, whatever Farah's raised, I don't want to repeat it, but I actually think that the issue about mainstreaming services being um, inclusive is a long, long journey that's been known for a very, very long time. And hence the reason that our organisation and other organisations that work with BME communities are still around, because we've been bridging that gap. And about cultural awareness, to staff of mental health services. We and others have been doing that for many, many years. But the fact of the matter is, if it's not, if it's not embedded in the culture of those organisations, it doesn't happen. It happens as a piece of work, and then it's moved on to the next piece of work. And all the groundwork that has been done with one organisation or one service provider is never handed on. If those things had happened, and I don't want to go on into you know raising that there have been so many reports and consultations over the years, and some amazing pieces of work done over three-year periods to actually discuss these issues and ask what the barriers are and be given the recommendations, but nothing has changed, and I think that's what the pandemic has brought out. That this disparity is still there, and it continues to be there, and it will not change until the internal structures change. That there is a huge issue here that people need to acknowledge, and we need to move on it. But it is about funding, because that's what it comes down to. If we're a small organisation, and if we don't have funding to even bridge that gap or be able to provide the cultural awareness to the mainstream services, then how is that going to happen? So there needs to be a real acknowledgement of how third sector BME organisations are funded, and how they are able to help mainstream. Because in my in my opinion, and this is from my personal point of view, I was born and brought up here. I'm 68 years old. And if I'm and we've been working for 35 years in the voluntary sector. And we are still, when we are spoken to, when we are invited somewhere, we are still the add-on. We're never part of the mainstream. And that is something that really needs to be raised at the highest level. That that the organizations continue to be in the third sector, funded by the third sector, and we're always everybody is always scrambling and looking for the funding to continue their very, very vital services. You know, there, there are so many different BME communities where the women have come with different issues. You, we're, we're, I'm talking about the Sikh community, there's the Muslim community, there's the South Asian women who come from Vietnam and Thailand and places like that. Where do they go? So I, I, I really think that there needs to be change at the highest levels. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Trishna, for that. Um, Miriam, you wanted to come in, yeah? Thank you. Um, just kind of following on from what Trishna had said, funding is always a big issue. Um, as BME organisations, we're kind of pitted against one another, and it really shouldn't be like that. But the one thing that I would say in really working in the violence against women sector for so long, there, there's a few issues within Scotland. First of all, we're not adopting the buy and for model when it comes to third se sector organisations, which means that if we are supporting BME women, we should be an organisation by BME women. You've got a lot of organisations that have like BME add-ons. However, they don't have any BME women on their boards. They don't have any BME women in senior management. It's an absolute massive issue within Scotland if we're really looking at equalities. We've got a lot of third sector frontline organisations providing services for BME women, but they really don't understand our experiences um, with intersectionality and all the kind of issues that we face. So it's kind of almost like a theoretical way of supporting us rather than an actual practical grassroots way. Um, the other thing that I would say is when it comes to violence against women, we're still really not there. We are so far behind when it comes to looking at England and Wales when it comes to supporting BME women experiencing violence against women. Um, in AMNA, I think the amount of calls that we had um, and when I had started, I had staff saying to me, we're absolutely inundated with violence against women, you know, domestic abuse, and that was my specialism. We had to actually get funding elsewhere to just get a women's rights caseworker just to support women with domestic abuse issues, and that funding now comes to an end. But one thing that I've always said is when it comes to supporting women experiencing domestic abuse, especially no recourse to public funds, it requires a lot more time and resources. Now, when you're looking at organisations like Amina, Seeks and Drogue, all those organisations, we're doing the exact same amount of work as other organisations. However, I would actually argue that the work that we're doing takes twice as long to deliver. However, our targets are the same. The funding that we get is the same. So actually, we do need a lot more investment within organisations that are specialist services. And yes, you can have two women's rights organisations like AMNA and BME because the work that in Seeks and Joke, because the work that we do is similar but different, but also the women that we support, it's a lot more time intensive, but that does not seem to be accounted for anywhere, especially when it comes to funding. Miriam, thank you for that. Convener, if it's okay, it's just a quick follow up what Miriam's just said there. Miriam, can I ask the question, and I think it applies to all the organisations because you've did a lot of really good work. Do you think that um, being women are more comfortable? coming to your organisations because you understand the kind of culture and um, you know the family uh, kind of structure around everything uh, and not going to your usual, um, you've just said many third sector organisations that provide help for domestic abuse and you know do mental health and even just direct domestic abuse. Do you think that's why they come along because they think that you feel that you understand it more and you did mention Miriam that they don't see people like us, I'm going to be honest, right, on those boards. So they can't really. And, you know, I did this all my life. I can see people like me even in politics. You know, so I totally understand what you women are talking about today. But do you think that's why they come to yourselves more? You know, I think it's the sense of you don't need to explain it as much. So if you're coming to a specialist service, you're not having to say something like, you know, you might have um, the evil eye, for example. You know, I'm sure Pam, you would know. You know, we're like, oh, but you know, she's got the evil eye. And, you know, it's all those things that almost like sound like you're a bit insane for saying these things. But these are genuine issues, you know, within our community. You know, if you're looking at spiritual abuse or black magic, these are all kind of things. If you were to kind of explain that to an out with organisation, they would probably think, well, what is this person on? But when you're coming to a specialist organisation, they just kind of get it. But also, I think it's about having that option there. And um, Sometimes we do put women towards specialist organisations because, again, we get it. We understand there's that there's there's not that need to kind of explain and explain. But also, I would say that other normal mainstream organisations just don't have they do have the understanding, but when they realise how time intensive it is, but it's almost like we take it, we just know that yeah, this is what we need to do for no recourse to public funds or whatever. And then I would say that organisations like ourselves, we've almost built that in that we know that the work that we do is actually much harder. I would say, but yeah, I would say that we definitely do provide that bespoke service, but so do all BME organisations. But again, 
I, I mean, the biggest part for me, again, is just equalities. If you are providing a BME service, absolutely brilliant, but make sure that you've got BME women either on your board or in senior management, because otherwise you're not truly providing that service to our community to, for us to actually have that equal footing. Thank you very much, Marion. Thank you very much, ladies. Over to you, convener. I, I think uh, there's a few, few folk once again, but I think Sarah hasn't hasn't contributed to this bit of the debate. So, Sarah, I'm, I'm sorry to the other two who are keen to get back in again. There just isn't time. But Sarah. Yes, thank you. I'll be very quick. I totally agree with uh, what Mariam have said. My pup my BME pupils always tell me exactly as as Mariam said. It's not that it's not that white people won't help us. It's not that white teachers won't understand what we're talking about. It's that it just takes them longer to get there. Um, so yes, definitely. Uh, and you know, sometimes it is a language barrier. It doesn't. We don't have to speak the same language. I find sometimes. Uh, that just, you know, from looking at each other, knowing that we are people of colour, we know that we have experienced certain things. We understand, you know, that in, we understand what that stamp on our passport means when it says no recourse to public funds. You know, yeah, we know not only understand that we know what it feels like. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Sarah. If we can now move on to Karen Adam, please. Thank you, convener, and thank you to the panel. Um, your answers have just been, you know, overwhelmingly just fully comprehensive, and I really have gained um, and expanded my education on this this morning. So I really do thank you for that and, and for that opportunity for myself. Looking at the British Medical Journal study from September of last year on the lived experiences during the pandemic of minority ethnic women in terms of access and experiences of maternity care, and it includes the experience of their physical and mental health and well-being, there are four emergent themes, including communication, interactions with healthcare professionals, racism and the effect of the pandemic, with uh, further sub-themes identified. I want to really hone down on the communication aspect of this. Communication or lack thereof played a major role in the participants' uh, perceptions of whether they were receiving acceptable care. This consisted of routine or emergency interactions with midwives, obstetricians, general practitioners, and health visitors. So, despite the high standard of English spoken, most participants felt that language barriers were the most common cause of miscommunication between themselves and healthcare professionals. They concurrently felt that they themselves were more likely to make inappropriate decisions regarding their healthcare as a result of misinterpretation. I would like to ask you, is this reflected across society, not just in healthcare, but in financial, social, education and more? And how do you see progress being made in addressing this issue? Um, could I open that up to Mariam to start with, please? Thank you so much, Karen. Um, when it comes to, I think, health and access to health, um, it's, it's interesting that you say that communication has been an issue, even although the language barriers have maybe not been there. But I would kind of maybe say, is it maybe because there's maybe been communication on our part, or already preconceived judgments on healthcare from healthcare professionals on BME women? Um, you know, certainly we've had a lot of BME women that you know have maybe gone through maternity care, etc., um, and the way they've maybe been spoken to or treated. But actually, when they've started speaking, they're like, "Well, actually, we're British-born. We know what we're speaking about. You know, or whatever." Or a lot of BME women um, have actually experienced um, a lot of racism within the healthcare system. Um, a lot of, well, you know, is she exaggerating or she's not understanding, um, or just just trying to get that service? Um, there was a lot of triage calls. Etc. So um, that was, I think, a big barrier for a lot of BME women because it was very much like, can you just tell me on the phone what's wrong with you? Um, and you know, I think that created a lot of barrier for BME women. But I really think when it comes to communication, um, especially when it comes to health services. I actually think from my experience of supporting so many BME women, a lot of them are not actually taken seriously. Um, you know, we've actually had that we've actually had to go to doctor surgeries and midwives and nurses' appointments to actually explain certain things. So there is that kind of I would say a lot of discrimination within the healthcare system still with BME women. Thank you. Um I noticed Trishna wants to come in here. Yes, thanks, Karen. 
Um, I, don't, I think um, everything that, that's been said before is right, but um, I, you know, like I can give you a couple of examples that happened during the pandemic. And as from a personal point of view, somebody that was pregnant, taken into hospital, we were it was, it was the lockdown. She wasn't allowed to have any because of her mental health. They were, there was an explanation from the doctor to the um, symptoms to say that this person is coming in, well, real, you know, very mentally unstable just now because of um, um, her health, and um, but she's expecting a baby. Will be accompanied by her mother and husband. We went up, went inside. Uh, the reception was, was fine. The midwife came out, and she stood in front of the person and the, the mother of the child in the wheelchair, the pregnant lady in the wheelchair, the husband's the next chair, and the mother supporting her. And the, the midwife looked at the girl in the wheelchair and said to her, does she, does she know, is she your mother or is she his mother? And does she know that she shouldn't be here? Um, you know, and this, I was so shocked and so upset by this, this woman speaking like that. And I thought, and it was actually it was so personal. Like I'm sharing it because I feel that people need to hear this. This was me with my daughter. Mm. And this woman looked at me and said, "She." And then I turned around and I said to her, "She knows exactly what she's talking about, and she's here because the doctor advised her to come here." Now this was just right in the middle of the first lockdown, and you know. It was, I was so shocked by it all. I came out, I was literally shaking. And I stood outside and I thought to myself, if this is how I'm being treated, and I consider myself to be an articulate person who understands everything, I hate to think what's happening to somebody that would really come in here with a mother that might have difficulty with English. Mm -hmm. So very painfully, you have to admit, and I find it really painful to admit this, the discrimination within the hospitals is, is just terrible. If you get somebody, and there is, and, and it's a shame because you don't want to tar everybody with the, the, the same brush. And the NHS frontline staff have done amazing work, but these situations are still happening. And then, when you're talking about the services, I mean, there's a perinatal team that's based in Livingston, and we'd never heard of it. But these support women who are pregnant and have had mental health problems or maybe have a mental health illness that they're dealing with. And that perinatal service had never worked with anybody from any ethnic community. So there, there's there's things there that are out there that people are not accessing because they don't know about them. Or they're mm -hmm. not being prepared by the doctors. Now I'm I'm assuming that a perinatal team that's, you know, from a doctor's surgery, if you have a mental health nurse there, somebody should be able to refer people on to that. And so there, there's gaps there where people are losing out on services because they don't know about them. And it's not all down to the language barriers and everything. Like we said, a vast majority of the women that we deal with are all first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation born and brought up here. But actually, sadly, the colour of your skin matters. You walk in somewhere and they some people just take one look at you and think, she can't speak English. So it's a sad state of affairs. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Trishna. That was um, really um, heartfelt and um, enlightening, um, although sad to hear. But it does um, expand upon the, the question in regards to the communication and not just spoken English. I don't think anybody else has asked to come in there, convener. Okay, thank, thanks. What would you know? Coming. They're just popping. They're just popping oh, in the chat yeah, now. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. E joy. Sara? Yeah. Sorry, yes, I thought you were telling us that there was little time to come back, so I didn't want to uh, yeah. sorry, sorry, just trying to keep time for after each of the committee members have a question. So um so sorry, I just wanted to come back. Your name, Sarah. Just wanted to come back to that question of language. Because we've noticed this too, um, and uh, and also as AAI, we know our limitations. I have a very diverse team, but if we have a domestic abuse problem, we transfer them. We will relate them, but we do go to you, the local, the well-known, the young, the small organisations in the third sector. So we have a list of you all, and we give those to the women. So we trust you. I have to say that. Um, 
language. Um, the, the thing that we have noticed is that language of our minority ethnic women who are looking for work has deteriorated through COVID. And, and this is absolutely a, a, a key to their employment. Um, now, Zoom isn't helping. Um, they've not met many people lately. They've been in isolation for all the reasons we know about. Um, their mental health has deteriorated. And with that, their command of the English language. Um, so that just has to be taken into consideration. Um, I, I, we noticed that the, the portals on Zoom, people take about four weeks to actually work through that shyness to talk, and then they're there. Um, so I, yeah, that has to be factored into this. Um, um, okay, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and Hi, I just to want to... Yeah, I wanted to just uh, add another comment um, um, about uh, healthcare. To something on the back of what Trishna um, has said. I, to start with, I would like to just say um, from from the work that I've been doing in, in um, a course uh, run by Education Scotland, building racial literacies, and also the work with Stock. We know that different BME communities are affected differently, and of course, you know the the more uh, the more you differ from the, the Scottish white standard, the more of a target you become. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry. And, you know, yes, I, I have had times as well where people, you know, will just, you know, speak to me loudly and slowly just in case I don't um, understand what they say. Um, but I wanted to to just, just say that there are communities that are affected much more than others. And that needs to be understood that, you know, people of colour will, will suffer different types of discriminations. Um, language, of course, um, is one of them. I wanted to share something. Uh, when I, when the midwife registered my child, um, they didn't want to register as other. So they wanted to register him as white. You know, and I'm not white, and my partner isn't white, and, you know, he certainly doesn't look white. Um, I, I don't know. They, they, it, it felt almost like, okay, so you guys, you, you are, a, you know, you're the half is a PhD student, you're a teacher, you're somehow not quite BME, because it, it felt it felt wrong. Um, and that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Okay, th th thanks very much. Thanks, Karen. Uh, can, I, if, can I go to Alexander Stewart, please? Thank you, Convena. And can I just commend uh, the outstanding contributions we've heard this morning during this evidence session? It has really been quite enlightening. I want to once again go back and look at the education, training and employment. Uh, you made it quite clear today uh, that there is definitely a need uh, to try and support women from ethnic minorities to ensure that they build back their confidence after the pandemic. And in the short and medium term, what do you think we need to do to ensure that becomes a reality, because it's quite obvious from what I'm hearing today that we are certainly failing women from that section of society. There are many obstacles, barriers. Uh, you've talked about them already, and we're aware of that uh, from evidence we've taken uh, previously. But there has to be a way back for all communities, but for your community, the BEM community, the ethnic minority community, who are disadvantaged, uh, who are not progressing to what is required, what lessons can be learned so that we can actually go forward and not go back? Because what I'm hearing today in this evidence session looks like we're having a backward step, that the confidence is lost, the individuals themselves don't feel they're worthy, they're not able to progress into the management roles, they're not able to get the opportunities, uh, and, and we need to maybe have a, a sea change of attempt to try and make that happen. Uh, so it would be good to maybe hear from Joy, uh, because you have vast experience within that sector, and then maybe Miriam, and if others want to come in, happy to take that. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Great. Um, so some of the uh, funding from government around employability was and remains too prescriptive for the reality of these women's situations. 
we had PhD graduates doing low paid cleaning or catering services from home, for example, uh, which is amazing, just great initiative. Um, but then taking this initiative during difficult times meant that they were not eligible to join an, program, uh, an employment program aimed at getting women exactly like them back into work because they were deemed in employment. So even if they were working two hours a week, they weren't allowed to join this program, which suited exactly what they needed. So this confused women who, who felt let down by us and by government. And what we saw was motivated, qualified women who had been passed over uh, before, uh, now ineligible for government support programs because they'd done what they needed to do to survive. Um, so government confirms that there are other initiatives that they could benefit from, but um, we hear from the women that these initiatives do not help them get a job commensurate to their skills level, which is what they want. So we would like underemployment to be taken seriously and treated in a similar way to unemployment. Thank you. Um, I I can go on. I have a couple of other points. Thank you. Sure. Um, minority ethnic women have qualifications, and in particular those returning to work, shouldn't be forgotten in, in, in this journey. Um, they can be very quickly and affordably helped into work, reducing government statistics. They have skills, they just need to know how to present them with confidence. The focus should be less on their training, and at the moment we're being told to, to, to concentrate on upskilling and training. And for us, the main thing is language training, where it's needed. Um, but we want more on breaking down the barriers that employers in particular are, being, are putting up that prevent these women entering the workforce. We're putting too much focus on the issue is with the women. It's not. Most of it is with the employer and the barriers. Um, so when we do a program, um, uh, whether it's for women or for employers, we always include both so that they can hear from each other and learn from each other. Um, it has to be organic between them. Um, so we know this from experience of mixing these two parties together frequently over the years. It's, it is actually a match made in heaven where they teach each other. Uh, jobs commensurate to their skills level are key here. And with our personal intervention introductions, we're also able to place those furthest from the market due to language difficulties by highlighting to employers that these women have the skills. Just look at their skills. That's all that matters. Don't look at where they got their uh, degree from. Don't look at their name. Just look at the skills because we know you need those skills. The more employers we talk to, the more women we are getting into work. Another point is that um, ME women from non-Commonwealth countries who have gained a STEM or an allied health professional degree, medical, dental, engineering, they may not be familiar with the professional registration standards in the UK. They're not aware that they can contact the relevant professional membership body or the organisation to get guidance on how to practise their profession successfully in the UK. And they may also be confused about the difference between a trade union and professional standards organisations. So due to the shortage of certain skills in the UK, government really needs to work with professional membership bodies on establishing a clear pathway on how to assist professional ME women uh, trained overseas to practise their profession legally in the UK. The cost of taking exams to practise certain professions is also quite high, which can be a deterrent. Um, but such highly trained women would also benefit from funding and, and mentoring from respective professional bodies. And in fact, one of my, we have dentists in our present program, we have teachers, we have doctors, um, and we're struggling to help them requalify. So one of my team took the initiative to talk to a senior Indian female dentist in her practice in Scotland about the two dentists on the program. Um, and the, Indian female dentist said that they are crying out for dentists. And, and, and she was aware that the government 
site, the website was difficult to navigate. And this dentist said that what we AAI was doing was a great initiative. And she was insistent that the dentist profession needed these women to help them get through this complicated process of uh, requalifying, or the women needed them, that they needed to meet these women, I beg your pardon, um, uh, in order to help them get through this process. And she offered to go straight to the General Dentist Council and get it sorted and speak to our cohort personally so that they get the best access to information and mentorship. She felt it was the best way to get them into meaningful employment that equals their qualifications and skill sets. So, so clear access to support for these professions will ensure highly qualified talent doesn't resort to precarious work to bring in money for the family. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Joy. That, that was a very good answer and in depth. And if I may me now go to Miriam for her response to it as well. Thank you, um, Alexander. Um, just to answer your question, I think what we do need to do is invest in more employability programmes. Um, um, I would say that in AMNA, we do have an employability programme, and it looks at helping women do CVs, ESOL classes, employability skills, what is needed, volunteering opportunities. But again, you know, we're always struggling when it comes to funding and actually constantly with the demand that also comes in. And with that targeted recruitment for employers, I would really welcome that. Just like Police Scotland have done, there was also targeted recruitment for like teachers' assistants. They looked at BME communities, um, religious communities. They went to them and said, look, we're looking for BME more BME women to become teachers assistants. And that targeted recruitment has really, really helped last year in getting more BME women to maybe apply and actually consider that as a profession. But also I think there needs to be accountability when it comes to highly qualified and highly skilled jobs also. Um, I think organisations need to have that accountability about um, do you have any senior management that are BME? Do you have any senior management that are on boards? Again, if we were to really do that analysis of Scotland, the amount of BME women's rights organisations themselves that just do not have any brown or black women on boards or within their senior management team, it's an absolute issue, especially when they're running BME-specific projects. So I think there needs to be an accountability, accountability with organisations, but also targeted recruitment and in more investment within specialist BME organisations to actually deliver employability programmes. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think maybe Krishna wanted to come in. Thank you, Alexander. Um, yeah, just to add to what everybody else is saying, we've been running employability programmes for more than 25 years. We've worked in partnership with the local job centres, and we know that that one-to-one -one support that women need help them to actually access, fill in forms, have the confidence to go for an interview are really important. So just to send them or refer them on to the job centres and say that you can get, a, you know, go there, you can have to go in there, that just doesn't work. And we have. The evidence to prove all of that, and we have had funding in the past to do that kind of work and bridge that gap between the job centres and um, the women, and to be able to get them to that stage where they're able to apply for jobs. And so there, there does need to be more funding put into these things. And again, it's the same as before. Until that gap is closed by mainstream, which doesn't look like it's going to happen in the near future, then people need to start acknowledging that these services that we are providing on the ground for women from these BME communities are vital. And without them, you will never have a diverse workforce. You can look at both scales of it. You can look at it from Joy's end, and then you can look at it from our end. And there's a huge gap there. So I think somewhere along the line, this needs to be acknowledged, taken on board by the powers that be. Thank, Thank you, you for that. And I think, Farah, you want to come in as well. And that will be the end can you for me. Thank you very much. Um, so I've, I've been taking notes. I'm not going to reiterate what um, our colleagues have been saying. So regarding training women in employment, uh, through the work that we do through the Race for Human Rights program um, at Sembo Scotland, this is exactly what it is that we work with clients. It is about looking at how are we going to get more ethnic minorities into employment, and obviously the, the specific scope in here is about getting ethnic minority women into employment, um, as well as you know taking cost of action measures and employability programmes. I think what we can take forward from this pandemic is the number of transferable skills that ethnic minority women have gained. For example, becoming negotiators, 
with the even if it's about you know managing between family members or children fighting at home or you know becoming home educators the things the amount of skills that we have had to learn um at home um should really be seen to be encouraged as transferable skills what also i really want to kind of hone down on and i'll make this quick quite uh, quick is the fact that any any uh, clients that we support the first thing is that we ask what is your data what does your data look like um and that in itself is um an issue in itself that we still have inadequate measures of collecting data on ethnic minority women within Scotland and um that is something that desperately needs to be looked at um when, when we look at doing for example deep dive sessions we see you know what what are the actual barriers that are preventing women ethnic minority women from applying for certain jobs is it because of a certain skill set is it because of racial discrimination um most likely it is because of racial discrimination um and these are things that we do work on and on on the back of that obviously this committee um you know we're sitting with MSPs you uh, I, we you know following holding public services and public leaders um, to account um, and following through in the public sector quality duty is just as important um so I'd look to yourselves as again policy makers and ensuring that when it comes to collecting data and fulfilling public sector equality duties that this is on the front line because without the data without the evidence it is really hard to then advocate that what is actually needed we know what's needed because we've lived it but when you're translating this into policy and positive action measures that evidence is required and the fact that there is still that disparity of trust between leadership and frontline um, and, and such things like disclosure rates it is really hard to find out exactly what what are the needs what are the gaps that need to be filled so that is something um, I hope that the committee would take back um, in, in terms of looking into as well um, and obviously Symbol Scotland do uh, support ethnic minority women and men as well into employment through our different uh, programmes and projects. Thank you very much, uh, Convina. I think that covers the question. Thank, thank you. Can, can I go to Pam Gossel, please? I'm fine now, Convener. Yeah, I asked the question. It was basically oh, um, I mixed the, my question into both one question in relation Brilliant. to one size fitting all. Yeah, Thank thanks. you. Um, Pam Duncan Glancy, do you want to come in now? Um, please, that would, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for that. I, I know earlier on that um, there was a, a comment made about the unpaid work of people. And, and, and that particularly struck me, actually, um, because I, I can I can see how how you will have had to put in um, considerably more, more hours of support. I wonder um, if you could um, tell us what you think part of this, what you think the solution to that is, and if you think that the, the organisations you're working with and the people you're working with are getting enough support um, financially to, to recruit the number of staff that you need to address some of the problems you've raised today. Do you want to direct that somebody? Um, I, I I didn't write down the name of the person who made the comment. It was it was really early on, but if someone who if the person who said that could remember um, that that they'd said it, maybe they, they could come back. Um, otherwise, I get I guess um, maybe um, Maria Morfara could. Okay, Ma Mariam's nodding. So yeah, thank you, Pam. Um, uh, so I would say, yeah, when it comes to staff, I think this is probably all third sector organisations. Do we ever feel like we've ever got enough funding? We're always fighting for funding and we've got a cocktail of funding, which is always a dangerous situation to be in, but it needs to be done. Um, what I would say is, is that certainly in my time in Amina, what I have tried to do is be more realistic with our targets. Um, and really go back to funders and say, look, you know, we know that you're wanting us to support, for example, 12 women, and that might not look like a lot, but actually look at the amount of time and resources this is going to take. There has definitely also been a burnout of staff. I think this has been all organisations that have said this. But really, it's been about for me speaking to my staff and supporting them through this, you know, whether it's been through external counselling. It, it, 
extra team meetings. Um, but I mean, I would say that my background has always been in advocacy, it's always been in women's rights, so really I kind of get it, you know. So I think being that listening ear you know, for your own staff, but also just understanding how difficult it is. But really, to, to, to summarise this, funding, I mean, I, I, I keep going back to this, BME organisations, and especially when we're looking at inequalities, we need that extra investment. But when we're applying for violence against women funds or equality and human rights funds, we're pitting for the exact same money. And really, that intersectionality is not taken into account that actually maybe we do need the same amount of work that we're going to deliver, but rather than have one worker, we need two workers. Unfortunately, I would say it's still not built into our funding streams to reflect that, but I'm sure that would be the same with all the colleagues on this call. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. I think Trish was wanting to come in, Pam. But to add to that, um, um, the thing is that all of that around funding is so vital for our organisations that we had applied the Human Equality and Human Rights Fund and we didn't get anything. And yet we were the only Sikh family support charity in the whole of Scotland supporting women from the Sikh community. And because of the loss of that funding, we lost our outreach worker who was reaching out to over 100 people a week. And we, we, we are, we're now having to wait until the next round of funding before we can actually employ somebody. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the referrals have stopped. The referrals are still coming in, and I'm having to pick them up. So there's a real misunderstanding, mismatch somewhere when we apply for funding for a, for a real fundamental aspect of the work that we are doing, and we don't get anything, and then we're having to look elsewhere for that funding. It's, it, you know, it, it just defies the imagination because you think then, well, why are we always having to fight for funding? So does nobody appreciate the work that we do? Is it not acknowledged at some level? And is it, is it then really just an add-on that they're there, they'll do it? Other, you know, like mainstream organisations are funded by statutory services. Why is there no single BME organisation that is under the statutory umbrella, whether it be social work? health and social care, or anything like that, whether it's children's services. So it's a question rather than, I know we are looking for solutions, but the solutions are there. We are delivering the solutions, but we are not, they're, they're not being acknowledged in the right way, because if they were, then we wouldn't be looking for funding to keep us going. So we have the solutions. We're delivering them. All of the organisations are doing that. Thanks. I think Farah would like to come in. Thank you very much. Um, so, in, in terms of the solutions um, to, towards, like you know, supporting the recovery um, and, and looking forward, I mean, we can. We, if only money was the the solution to all of our problems, that would be an easy fix, wouldn't it? Um, but also looking at what the, the circumstances that we're in, obviously with with finances, with the budget, with the economy. Um, as well, I think what what COVID and lockdown has definitely taught us is that it's time to work smarter, not harder. And that when we look and the Scottish government have acknowledged the fact that there is institutionalised racism within Scotland. And I think if you were to bring in people with those lived experiences, um, with those with including the professional experience, into those more leadership positions. And have that diversity within that workforce. It's very, that trickles down in terms of you know because we know ethnic minorities um, when it comes to employ the employment market there is a higher gap between white and non-white um, applicants. So there, there is a, a lot of groundwork that does need to be done in, in terms of supporting that recovery. And even when it comes to training um, and upskilling, and it is needing. To be flexible, um, I think the best thing that we learned again out of um, the, the positives to take away from being in lockdown was the flexibility of working from home, because that meant you know with childcare um, you could work from home and also you know uh, not have to worry as much about you know who's going to look after his children and you know that was a, a less of a financial responsibility, although it does take its emotional toll. 
the number of times my, I feel like banging my head off the wall when I've got my children in the background and they come into a meeting that I'm in. Um, so, but however, I, if it wasn't for the flexibility of being able to work in my role, I probably would not be in employment at the moment. Um, prior to me working with Semble Scotland, um, I worked part time, and it was just an, an as and when. So, I think that is something to kind of take positivity that we need to kind of go forward and allowing, not allowing, sorry, but promoting that hybrid working. Um, and those options and possibilities that are there now that we, we see, you know, through a digital connected economy. Um, and also, I think another uh, positive from being in lockdown is the awareness of mental health. Um, again, prior to lockdown, it was so hard to kind of explain why I had to leave my job because of mental health issues, because I suffered extreme paranoia and anxiety. Um, I couldn't leave the house, for example. So coming into lockdown was actually a blessing in disguise because that pressure was no longer there to, to leave the home. But also it meant that other people were more willing to understand what I was going through, therefore able to accommodate and make those uh, and be able to facilitate that. And I think going forward, these things need to remain as it is um, and being able to remember mental health comes first. Basic, you know, humanisation of, of people and um, I think in the chat bar as well, I've seen again the, the racial discrimination of um, ethnic minorities, not just in the workplace but within society, is something that is within the remit of everyone here to to actually act upon. Um, thank you. Right, thanks, Farah. I, I see Joy is is um, wanting to respond as well. Thank you. Um, so, um, no quick fixes here, um, but certainly um, some, hopefully, some easy solutions. You know, I would love to see a workplace that is accepting, if not embracing, of diversity. Um, these are long-term goals that need to be striven for. Um, Childcare, we have not been mentioned much today, but women wanting to work, they're going to need that. Um, a more holistic approach to training and employment guidance, um, definitely taking into consideration the importance of this uh, need for, for improved resilience. Finally, flexibility. Um, we touched on it before, but it is misunderstood by employers, and without them understanding what it means for women, um, minority ethnic women, and how important it is to fit around their culture, their needs, um, more education for employers to ensure, where possible, they offer hybrid or remote working, which is much more accessible for everyone. Um, it's sort of one good thing that's come out of the pandemic, in my opinion, is that remote working is now going to be able to give more access to jobs for minority ethnic women wanting to work because they can work from home with children on their laps. And they will do that. We've got one person who works full time. She has two children. She just manages around their needs. Um, so, and finally, you know, we know gender is an issue, we know race is an issue, and um, we know that this has been combat compounded by the pandemic for minority ethnic women, but whatever is done now going forward, we must be careful that support and resources do go to the most, um, most affected. Thank you. I see that Sarah would like to come in. Hi, uh, yes, um, yeah, I couldn't agree anymore with what everything that has been said. Uh, thank you so much for all reiterating that. Um, with regards to employment, I just wanted to add something about the teacher profession and, and GTC, GTCS standards. Um, uh, or teachers are, you know, there's a lot of qualified teachers in other countries that just find it, you know, exceedingly hard to qualify here in the UK. Uh, Scotland has a target. To meet by 2030, and to ensure that happens, we need to employ, we need to accept teachers of a diverse background into teacher education programs, 300 every year. 
And, you know, they're not sticking in the profession. They're not staying. And a lot of it is because of hostile environments. And I, I do think if there is an easier way to ensure BME um, workers in Scotland know their rights, and if we can shift that burden of proof a little bit, then employers will have to be more aware of what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, yes, racism, it is institutionalized, but it is also, you know, it is man-made. It is something that can be reversed with a lot of work, and I'm, and I'm hopeful and I'm faithful that it will happen, perhaps not for my generation, but for um, generations um, that follow us. And uh, thank you again for having us here. Thanks, Sarah. And, and I'm just going to go to Pam Gossel for a last quick question. Thank you very much, convener. The question was around, um, Sarah, you talked about working harder than your colleagues, you know, white females, white males. I just wanted to ask a question around that. That Did you work harder? Because, I mean, I've been talking to a lot of BAME women as well and reading a lot of the books and stuff, that sometimes we feel we need to work harder to put our position in society and, make, you know, uh, the guilt that we just need to work and um, for to be noticed. Do you think it's that, or do you think it was more the employer that was um, is pushing you to work um, differently from other colleagues? I think I put it kind of right. <laughs> um, I think I think it's both. I think it's the pressure that you have of you know I've had a baby, but it doesn't matter. I'll still do this. I'll still do that. I'll do you know I'll go over and beyond to prove that my male counterparts um, are not. Uh, getting some sort of advantage over me when it comes to a promoted post. Uh, so I think a lot of a lot of that is self-imposed pressure, you know, a bit like you know where it comes from the culture. Uh, but I do think um, there, you know, uh, there are times where you are given extra work and you think, why why am I given extra work? I remember uh, coming back from a weekend when I was ill. And there was an email sent to all my department, and they, you know, they asked them who can sort of supervise these, you know, mini dissertations that people have to do. And nobody answered. When I came back, I opened my email, and it landed on my desk. And I'm like, there's, there's 12 people here. Why, why am I not, you know? So I, you know, I, I fought it, and I didn't have to do it in the end. But it's, it, it does seem to be, you know, I think, and I think with little. Uh, yeah, I think for when staff needs to be disciplined, I think women often get those emails or those, you know, little comments like, "Oh, you didn't do quite right," and you know, I, I do think it is targeted. Um, and I'm not saying it's conscious, but it is there. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Pam. Yeah. Yes, that's me. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank, thank, thanks very much. And I, I, I guess that that last point was said is something that certainly that, that men in particular need to always be mindful of because sometimes emanation isn't conscious, but that doesn't make it doesn't make it okay. I'm sure. So th thanks um, hugely to all everyone for for coming along today and giving us a little bit more of of your time than than you'd agreed to. Um, it's been really really helpful. So th thank you all very much. We're now going to move into private session, and we'll start that private session in five minutes. Give committee members time for a quick break. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye.